Well, good afternoon. I'm Chris Scher, Member Communications Director of the Society of Broadcast Engineers and the co-host of this month's episode of the SBE Web Extra, the SBE Chapter of the Web. This is a monthly SBE meeting, and by watching this webcast, you'll earn one half of an SBE recertification point in Category G when you recertify. The SBE is the Association for Broadcast and Multimedia Technology Professionals with about 5,000 members, mostly in the U.S., but also around the world. And the host of today's SBE Web Extra is SBE board member Kirk Harnack, who is also the chair of the SBE Social Networking Committee. Hey, Kirk. Howdy, Chris, and thank you very much. Good to have you here and good to have you uh, ready to make some announcements for this SBE Web Extra meeting. Uh, I want to um, uh, well, I tell you what, why don't we quickly go ahead and, and give a little tease and introduce our guest and then we'll get to uh, to our announcements. Uh, I like to do it that way. That way you'll be excited and ready as I am to uh, hear from our guest, uh, who is Rodney Vanderveer. Rodney, welcome into the SBE Web Extra. How are you? Thank you very much. I'm really good and excited to be with you, gentlemen. Uh, it's good to see Chris and Kurt. It's good to see you again. Looking forward to the time we have together. Yeah, me, me too. Uh, and, you know, this year we had to uh, postpone the leadership development course that usually goes on in Atlanta uh, in early August. So, Rodney, we're going to be uh, uh, coming back to you in just a minute and asking you questions about leadership why it's important for broadcast engineers who are interested in furthering their career. And hey, if you're a member of SBE, you're probably interested in uh, furthering your career. So you've got, uh, you've written a book on this, literally written a book uh, that, that doesn't go with this course, but it's similar to what we're talking about, uh, the human behavior and organizations. And it's a terrific reference, uh, easy read too, about uh, leadership. But first, Chris Shearer is here and Chris has some announcements for us. Chris. Absolutely. I have your SBE member update for July 27, 2020. The annual SBE election of officers and half of the directors for the board of directors began July 17, and it runs through August 19. There's one candidate for each officer position and nine candidates for the six available director seats. Each SBE member receives has received a unique link to his or her ballot via email. If you opted out of electronic voting, if you don't have an email address on file or the email test message we send in advance had a problem, you'll receive a ballot through the mail, which should have arrived probably by now. Uh, this needs to be returned by mail as well. Please be sure to vote, whether it's online or by paper. These volunteers deserve your consideration. Also, the 2020 SBE Compensation Survey is now available. Get it through the SBE Bookstore at sbe.org slash bookstore. It's free to SBE members. There's a webinars by SBE on the calendar. On August 13, we present module six of the audio over IP series called, I, called AES 67 Basics, what it is and what it is not. Ken Tankle, Senior Product Specialist, Telos Alliance, discusses how the AES-67 standard for high-performance streaming audio over IP interoperability has become the standard that television and radio are using to meet their interoperability requirements. For info on webinars by SPE, go to sbe.org slash webinars. The next SPE local chapter exams will be held at chapters the week of August 7. The application deadline is already passed for that one, but the next local exam opportunity after that is in November. Submit your applications for that one by September 21. If a local chapter exam is not convenient for you, private proctoring is available. Contact the SBE National Office for details. And for more information on SBE certification, it's online. Go to sbe.org slash certification. And that is your SBE member update for July 27, 2020. Kirk? Thanks a lot, Chris. Appreciate uh, you with that member update. And I'm, hey, I'm particularly excited about the AES 67 Basics webinar that's coming up. It uh, happens to be a colleague of mine, Ken Tankle, who's going to be teaching that. So I'll just put in a plug for Ken. Uh, he's a dear friend and a great guy and a super smart engineer. Whenever I talk to Ken, I learn something. So you may want to, if you're, if, if you're into IP anything, uh, especially IP audio, uh, Ken Tankle is, uh, is a great teacher and uh, knows a lot. So check him out. Yep. All right. On today's uh, today's show, um, normally we talk about technical things or happenings within the SBE. Today, we're going to talk about something that I think is so important for us as broadcast engineers, uh, as employees in our organizations, maybe you're self-employed or maybe you work inside of an organization, and that is the topic of leadership. And leadership, I feel, is something that you can learn. You learn a few uh, basics and, and concepts and understandings, principles, and you can apply those in your life and in your career and really improve 
uh, your own stature and the way people look at you. And uh, and you can show leadership and hopefully become more valuable to those around you, especially uh, to your employer. And uh, to speak to that, uh, he's back here. He's, he's here. Rodney Vanderveer. Rodney, again, welcome into this uh, to our show, uh, the SBE uh, Web Extra. Thank you very much, Kurt. It's really good to be with you. And, and I have to reinforce what you said, because if we didn't believe leadership could be learned, then we're wasting our time at these leadership conferences that we have. So looking forward to doing this again. I think it's going to be on June 8th through the 10th, 2021, to try to make up for what we just lost this year, which will be the 50th year, by the way. Right. And, you know, this this year of all years was a year where I've had a little bit of extra time here and there, and I felt like I could have the freedom to uh, either take a couple days off from my full time job uh, at Telos, or uh, maybe Telos would uh, you know would would not make me take the days off to go down there. Either way, I was willing to do it uh, to go see you in Atlanta uh, at the hotel near the airport where you've been having this uh, co uh, course, but. But but COVID put a put a, a wrench, a monkey wrench in, in those plans. But you already do have plans for this rescheduled in June uh, of next year, 2021, right? That's correct. Kathy contacted me. We knocked around on quite a few dates. And the last ones that I received is June the 8th through June the 10th at, uh, at Atlanta at the same hotel we've been in for the last uh, quite a few years. Looking forward to that. Well, let's let's jump right into some of these topics here. Uh, I think the a basic question is, uh, why is this even important? Let's understand the importance of leadership and, and what you teach. Why is this important for engineers to learn? Well, let me give you actually kind of start with uh, two definitions of leadership that I use. One, it says leadership is the art and science of getting the job done through the willing efforts of other people. And there's some key parts of that it says, well, leadership is an art. And it is a science. The art probably is perhaps are skills you're born with. The, the science sides are things that you can learn. So leadership is the art and science of getting the job done. So we're paid to get the job done. And this is where we have to use the soft skills. And oftentimes we think the soft skills are the touchy feely stuff, but in fact, the soft skills are the hard skills. And uh, we need to in fact, learn the soft skills in order to more effectively work within the organization. Now, one of the uh, things I really focus on and I've moved to the front of the list. I got to share with you prior to retiring from Purdue, I spent 30 years in the business world. So I really enjoy the business, uh, come, the, the business environment and the, the, the challenges that we have there. And in fact, in the material that we use on um, communication, every business I consult with, every business I've managed myself and even at the Purdue University, uh, one of the biggest issues we have is that with communication. Uh, so actually, in the very first page on my effective communication packet that everybody would be exposed to if they attend the training is a quote from Chris. It says, with attention to detail, consideration of proactive effort and focus on a career, a great leader will emerge. Clear communication is the key to success. So with that, I normally begin my sessions with asking people, um, where does communications occur? And almost without exception, everybody was saying, well, it's everywhere. And that's not really true. But then the second question is, when does communications occur? And so that's when we're talking back and forth. So if I go to Webster's Dictionary and look up what communications really is, it's defined as sending and receiving messages. So let's play a little bit with that. If hmm. I send a message to you, it says, Merahaba, also send us, Bukhanava Chokazel. I'm sending you a message and you're receiving it, but I seriously doubt if anybody on this understands what I'm saying. I lived for Turkey for, I lived in Turkey for two years while I was in uh, the military. And so I had to learn to speak the language of it. So Merahaba's hi. Uh, Nasıl Sena says, how are you? And Buganavad Chokazel, I hope your day is going very well. So I'm sending and receiving, but we're not communicating cause something is missing there. So back to the first question and every, and we'll certainly cover this in a lot of detail. In fact, 55% of the communication process is through body language. We'll talk a lot about body language in this, but so the question is, where does communications occur? And the answer is inside of the mind of the receiver. So the person we're trying to communicate with as leaders, we have to figure out how to get inside their minds. And the second part of that, when does it occur? And the answer is it occurs when it's understood. So the lesson we want to take away from this is from that point forward, in every leader's application, you want to learn to communicate for understanding. And the key to that whole thing is the leadership lesson we take away from that is 
how do you communicate for understanding? And the answer is you have to learn to ask the right questions. Do less talking and do a lot more listening and asking the right question to get inside that person's mind. Find out what it is. Go back to our definition. Leadership is the art and science of getting the job done through the willing efforts of other people. So what is it we have to do to help that person become a willing participant to get the job done? So that's getting inside the mind and communicating for effective uh, performance that we need to all do. Wow, that is a lot to, to bite off, but I, I, I understood. You know, I... I uh, I, I I think that I'm kind of good at communicating because I know that it's not a communication unless the person I, with whom I'm speaking understands my intentions or what I'm saying at least. But you mentioned asking questions, and are you saying that to ascertain the the understanding level of the person you're talking with? That certainly is part of it. Yeah. You got to ascertain mm. what what their level of understanding is. Uh, in your in your industry, there's a lot of jargon that's used. A lot yeah. of lay people don't understand the jargon or the technical language that you're using. So if you're trying to tell me that these signals and all this stuff's out there is, that's uh, able to get the signals out for the TV channels and for the radios and everything else going on, you're going to lose me. So the question is, we have to find out what the level of understanding is for the person you're trying to talk with, and that's true with new employees you're bringing in. What is their level of understanding with the technical knowledge of the jargon you have in your in your business? So that's just part of the equation, but the, your answer is, that's correct. Let's imagine that I'm a director of engineering at a, at a group of stations and um, a executive vice president or a senior vice president uh, of something or other from the organization comes to visit my station and i'm brought in to have a conversation about you know some improvements we're doing what are some questions that i might ask i as the engineer might ask of that uh, c-suite executive person um to ascertain his or her level of understanding so i know how to how to speak to to that person and before you answer uh there's an example that just has lived with me now for probably 25 or 30 years. A friend of mine was a salesman for the old original satellite music network that came about in the early 1980s. And he, you know, he had a, a travel trailer with a satellite dish on. He could pull up to a radio station, throw up the satellite dish and demonstrate satellite music network. Well, he was at a dinner party one time speaking with other station owners. And they didn't know about uh, trip cues to fire upliners or downliners, or, or they might have known a station ID. Uh, and one of the owners asked my friend, how does this satellite music network thing actually work? Well, he didn't care about the uplink frequency or the downlink frequency or much like that. My friend said, well, we play the music in Chicago. It goes up to the satellite and it comes down to your radio station. And that answer fully satisfied the curiosity of the station owner that he was talking to. Um, I thought that was genius. I, as an engineer, I don't think I would have had the perception to, to answer in such a simple and direct way. So now you tell me, what? how can I determine uh, how I need to be communicating with a new person who I'm speaking with? Well, part of the question there is, in fact, is considering who your audience is you're trying to communicate with and find out what their level of, of uh expectancy is. Uh, before we get to that, though, let me share with you that unless any question, why do we need to send that signal out? Why do we need to have the station? Why do we need to make these changes? Uh, let me ask the question, do, do we really know what it is that motivates people? Mm. And the answer to that question is, in fact, needs. So even though you're going to play this uh, uh, play this program, you're going to go with this new music, the question you're going to put in this this fancy technology, the question is, do we really have a need for it? So I'm going to have to convince the people that, in fact, there is a need for it and you need it in order for them to buy into it to make it work. So we have to find out what that need is. And the way we do that is, in fact, to ask questions, but also to put together the format that would, would have that uh, would make it work. I, I started earlier by telling you there's two definitions for leadership. The second mm -hmm. definition I leader says the leadership is a catalyst that transforms potential into a new reality, yielding positive results. So the other part of that is that an engineer with SBE is in fact a catalyst. They are a change agent. So finding out how to bring about that needed change, 
that the stations have to have the introduction of new technology is all done through communication. Gotcha. That oh, that, uh, yeah, it, it does. It kind of reminds me of, um, oh, back around 1983, 84, when uh, compact discs came out. <laughs> and, uh, and, and yeah, I've been around that long. And, and uh, as engineers, we thought, you know, the, these are going to sound better on the air than the vinyl that we've been playing. This was at an at a album rock station I was working at. Sure. And so, uh, yeah, we had to persuade, uh, uh, or we felt we should make the option available to the station uh, leadership, station ownership and programming people. Hey, there's a new technology out there that will make us sound better. Would you be interested in, in that? Is that along the right lines of asking a, a question? Sure it is, sure it is. But mm -hmm. let me uh, actually go a little deeper with your thinking. I'm mm -hmm. not sure where we're gonna go with this, but another lesson that we're gonna learn, I'm gonna jump over something really quick. And it does affect your industry significantly. Uh, I'm kind of a guru of, not a guru, I'm kind of a disciple of uh, Deadward, Deadward, Edward W. Jimming. Uh, I'll get it. <laughs> Dimming, Edward Dimming, uh, known as a, one of the followers of quality. He was asked one time, uh, if you can make some recommendations or help U.S. business, what one thing would you recommend that they do? And immediately he responded. You want to guess what his response was? Mm. His response was reduce variation. And variation mm. happens in the process. In your business, the more you can reduce that variation in the process, the greater predictability you have. And one of the roles of a leader is to be able to predict, if I do this, I'm going to get that. So when they introduce a new technology, will that help you reduce the variations you have in the process with respect to quality, with respect to repeatability, with respect to guaranteeing signals that we have? If in fact, if we can show that, reduce the variability in the process, we have better, we'll have better predictability and a better performance, a better quality product to come out. So one of the things we need to do is to figure out how to, how to use the technology we have to make that happen. Maybe go into the, uh, the small disc or uh, even to the USBs that we have now would, would be the way to go instead of vinyl. I, I by the way, like the disc better and I do vinyl, I think quality. So in, but to bring this up to more modern times, uh, we could be talking about switching to uh, audio over IP technologies yep. to improve yep. things and, uh, and even using audio over IP technologies um, uh, to, for example, for studio to transmitter links. Um, and then when we get to audio over IP to deliver to the uh, end user, as we are with, say, ATSC 3.0, uh, then, uh, as, as long as we can maintain the the uh, quality of, of of the of the packets of the packet delivery, then we should come up with uh, an even better um, uh, and more flexible uh, use of of technology, where we can deliver a beautiful signal, we can divide that up and have slightly lesser quality, and and deliver more signals, more opportunities for sales, more opportunities for business, and making money. So. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I see that where you want to reduce variation in process. It seems, though, that when we come across a new technology, um, especially if you're an early adopter, you're likely going to have a bit more complexity at first before things shake out and become uh, more, more easy. And that certainly was the days in the very early days of audio over IP. Uh, there were some, some difficulties in making sure that it, that it worked well. From a leadership perspective, though, you want to ask yourself, how can you sell that? And yeah. uh, there's a book I recommend in my courses by John Cotter. He says, what leaders really do. And he shares with you the, so really what you're doing, or what you're doing is introducing change, uh, which gets to our second definition of leadership. But in that, he says, most businesses don't start at the right place. They, uh, they, they try to start down the list someplace. And this is the comment, in order to bring about the change that leaders want to introduce, they have to create a sense of urgency. So if you introduce that new technology, if you introduce that new process, there has to be a sense of urgency on people's part to understand why we need to have that. So if we can start with that sense of urgency and then put a team together to make it happen, we'll be on the right path. But communicating that sense of urgency along with the vision that we have is gonna be key. And again, the John Cotter outlines that really, really well. And we cover that in our class. 
A lot of us engineers, so we feel that we're problem solvers. And in fact, in a conversation you and I had a few weeks ago, uh, we talked about this, that most engineers, a lot of, a lot of us are introverts, some are not, uh, but we are all typically problem solvers. How does that, the quality of being a problem solver, how can we uh, dovetail that or work that in or make that a part of the leadership we're trying to learn? Um. I think it has to be a key part of the leadership with problem solving. That's what you're paid to do is to solve the problems, getting the job done through the willing efforts of others. Uh, there's a there's a there's a book I read recently which uh, helps me a little bit in problem solving. I'm, I'm going to take two two paths here. The first path says sometimes we think we know what the answer is before we really do the the deciphering to find out what the cause of really is. So we, it's called jumping the cause. Mm -hmm. There's another path. I just finished a book called the Oz Principle. I'm not sure you ever heard of the Oz Principle, but it's fashioned after the Wizard of Oz. But in it, it says that, in fact, when you see a problem, uh, you actually see it. And if you see it, you own it. And if you own it, then you have to help solve it. And to help solve it, then you have to follow through and do with it. I mean, deal with it. So uh, the, uh, uh, there are several different problem solving techniques that are out there that are, uh, you can use the, uh, uh, my mind's going blank right now, but use the acronym for uh, SMART, for having to uh, simplify it, you know, measure it and put a goal together to try to solve it. But in fact, problem solving is a key element for a leader but also you have to get that done through a team of people. So learning how to work in teams is part of that problem solving process. Actually, that was the very next uh, question that I had for you. How does then that, you know, as, as engineers, many times we're tasked to work alone to solve problems by ourselves. Some engineers got some friends here in the TV business here in, in Nashville where I live, they have, they have a team. And um, uh, one engineer in, in particular, I know, I wouldn't mind being on his team. I think he's a good leader. Uh, he, uh, uh, but yeah, so, so as engineers, if we want to grow into a situation where we're leading other people, we're team building, um, that to me, for many engineers, might be a, just a whole different realm of, of, of thinking. How do you introduce engineers to team building? I, I couldn't help it. Uh, my mind just skipped a beat there, Kurt, when you're talking about... I, Really not. We're, I'm not really sure we're working individually when we have Google available to us anymore. <laughs> but uh, yeah. but with respect to team building, one of the things you need to do and learn the dynamics within a team is a, a principle we call the Tuckman model. We, as a leader, you have to understand the behaviors of people. That there is a process you go through, and you have to be able to read through the body language or through their eyes or the conversation or the questions you have. And the Tuckman model says that, in fact, uh, you are formed into teams or formed into a group. And then you there's a storming process that takes through. You know, who made you the leader? Why do we have to take that direction? Why don't you consider my ideas? Uh, why do I have to listen to you? Why don't you listen to me? Uh, when are we going to take a break? There's a lot of questions. There's a storming process that goes on. And everybody will go through that. Some more quickly than others, but in fact, you're form, storm, and there's a norming process. You begin to find out what your roles are, begin to find out how people are fit into different slots uh, more efficiently, more effectively, and, and meets their uh, their traits that they have on how to deal and how to do problem solving. And then you move into a performance stage. The whole process the uh, you're trying to do is create synergy within the team. And without the synergy, you're still a group. And we can all see synergy a lot of times in basketball or football teams. All of a sudden, things just start to click. Even within the, uh, the, the studios that you have, there seems oftentimes a synergy. Everybody knows what everybody else is doing. And there's a sense of uh, renewed excitement, a seems of coming together. That doesn't happen by accident. Leaders have to understand the dynamics that people have. And every time you bring a brand new person in, that whole process changes. So if you want to put a team together, learn how to do problem solving, you have to look at the process, the forming, storming, norming, and performing to, in fact, grow the synergy and hope you're problem solving at the high performing level. 
I like this uh, chart that's in your book here. I just found it uh, you, from the index, the, the Tuckman yep. model. And indeed, it, yep. it's nice to know that part of the process can be a little bit negative, as you point out here in, in the book. Um, there, it starts out yep. in neutral, and then we go a little bit negative with the storming as we find out about each other and who's ag who's against it and who's for it, right? Yep. And, and, yep. and who's going to be difficult, and maybe that difficulty can be turned into uh, some creativity. That Tuckman model, the form and storming normally performing is, is not mine, but when you put it on the graph with synergy, that is my my uh, publication, I guess, with respect to how to realize that some organizations, there are so much animosity and fighting between the leaders, a sense of jealousy or a sense of, of ownership or, or a sense of trying to one-upmanship that in fact, the team will still perform, but they perform it with the negative. They never want to work together again. They don't want, they don't like each other. Uh, they'll go ahead and get the job done to the minimum level required to get somebody off their back and then continue to move on to something else. The alternative is you'll have high turnover. People will leave if you have a poor leader and they don't understand how the dynamics of leadership works or the form and storm and norm and performing and watching for that. So there's, there's cues that a leader will in fact be understand when they watch the behavior of people within that team. And within that team, you can pick out, and that's when you need to bring the person aside and talk to them, and you're trying to get inside their mind. What is it that, that bothers them? What is it that they're relating to? And then how do you create understanding and a sense of urgency that we need to have you part of this team, and this is how you can bet, best fit into it. Sometimes uh, we come across this phrase, you can, you can get anything done or get a lot more done, if you don't care who gets the credit. Yeah. Now, uh, yeah. d does does that phrase play into uh, learning leadership? It, it works for me, it does. I, I absolutely believe that. In fact, uh, I've always told my bosses when I go to work for people, and I've, I've been from labor to director of operations for different companies and made full professor, but my job, every student went through, my job is to make them successful. I don't care who gets credit for it. And in the business world, my job is to make my boss successful. And uh, one of the keys we haven't talked about yet, that uh, one of the foundations for leadership is building trust. And the way you build trust is to, in fact, get inside people's minds and have them think and understand what you're trying to do. And it is for their benefit to satisfy needs that they have. It all has to back with leadership. And that's what we'll cover in this course. Indeed. Uh, it, it... <laughs> This, uh, this conversation is going very much like our, our first conversation. Yeah, that was the next thing about building trust. And you asked me, uh, would you follow anyone you don't trust? And that answer, and the answer is probably going to be no for most people. Yeah, That's correct. Why should I? If I don't trust you, why am I going to follow you? That, that's absolutely true. So leaders oftentimes will, will break that trust. Uh, and oftentimes, uh, not intentionally, but uh, out of necessity of a, of a maybe a plant shutdown or an organ or a, a studio or a station that's going to close, you know, and the people that's going to close, oh no, 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 it's not going to happen. But so there, there's has to there has to be ways that you can handle that without breaking that trust. But the foundation of leadership is based on trust. So if they trust you, they will follow you. So as a leader, you need to learn to develop that that level of trust. In a few moments, we're going to uh, talk about dealing with stress and uncertainty, but I, I'd kind of like to circle back around just a little bit because I, I like the fact that I've got this written text in, in front of me here. Um, and uh, the fact that you've got this book broken up uh, and your your uh, principles broken up into these different categories. First of all, understanding me. Um, yep. if, if you could give me a, a couple or three points about what are the key things about understanding me that I need to uh, make sure I do understand? Actually, the first six chapters is about understanding yourself. And uh, one of the chapter, I think it's uh, four, uh, we do a, a profile, it's called a CAP study. We do a profile. So you need to understand yourself with what, what are your behavioral tendencies? Are you an introvert or extrovert? If you look at the Myers-Briggs, you can certainly do that. Uh, are you a controller? Are you an analyzer? Are you a promoter? Are you a supporter? What, what are your behavioral styles that you're most comfortable with? So we want to put you in tasks and jobs and groups. And in fact, you can use that type of behavior uh, the best. Also, we need to also understand what is it that motivates you? Uh, what are the needs that you have? So if you understand what your needs are, 
there's nothing wrong with sharing that with your boss or your your team. Let them know what your needs are. They can help you satisfy that needs. It's going to make you a more productive member of the, of the team. And likewise, you're going to ask them. And they will only do that if they trust you. So it all you can mm -hmm. see how it all comes together there. Uh, next is the a big topic of understanding others. And you've touched on that a little bit already here in terms of asking questions. But what are a couple of good uh, things we need to um, uh, be mindful of when we're trying to understand others? Well, understanding others is, uh, you're, you're right. We've talked a little bit about that already with respect to team building, team building. Some of us enjoy uh, trying to be the big fish in a little pond. I'm sure you heard that saying before you want to be the little fish in a big pond or the big fish in a little pond, whatever you want to do. So what is your behavioral style? So how do you, in fact, understand others and work with others? How do you communicate with them to uh, get them to uh, respond the way that you would like to them respond as leaders? Uh, how do you deal with conflict? would be another one. Uh, the the question is, uh, you know, do you fight it? Do you avoid it? Do you aggressively go after it? Do you compromise or do you collaborate? Uh, do you cooperate? What, how do you deal with other people? So dealing that and handling uh, conflict would be another thing to, you need to understand how you deal with other people. I was just looking at that. I actually was going to ask you about conflict. So you've, you've, <laughs> you've answered it before I even asked. Good for you. How I does wrote the book. <laughs> I thought, yes, you did. It's got your name on it. <laughs> How, after the chapter on conflict, you've got a chapter on negotiation. Does negotiation come before, during, or after conflict? Or what are we talking about here in terms of negotiation? Most, most people see uh, negotiations as a win-win scenario. And the fact you're taught in labor management classes that it's a, you go through negotiations and you have a win-win. But in all reality, uh, the part I wrote, it's actually a lose-lose scenario. In order to have effective negotiations, both parties have to give us something up of value. And that may not be the best solution, but in order to satisfy, and I, I don't mean anything personal with this with, with anybody, but in fact, I always use the example of a divorce. When, you're, when a husband and wife are splitting up and going through a divorce, there's always a negotiation. There's always resentment going on. So I'm going to try to do one-upmanship. So you negotiate a settlement you have. That really is not the best solution. The best solution would be to try to have some collaboration, maybe come together and come up with some new ideas, how we can live together, or come up with some ideas, how we can, in fact, help the, the overall unity we have for each other. Or even if we do split in those separate ways, what can we do to still be friends and help each other? So uh, negotiations, the process is important. We need to understand it. But in fact, we need to understand there's also better ways to do that. In in my own uh, conflicts and negotiations, especially when we're talking about something that there could be a technical solution, I have so often found that um, if if I would if I would instead of butting heads with somebody, if I would go off and do some research, or if the other party did, or we both did. We might find that there's a solution that we neither of us was aware of, and right. uh, and and so it, it, I don't know how you get to that point, or if if you can count on that, uh, how you make sure that if there is a solution that neither of you had thought of, that you can that you can find it. But I have been in my own life so many times butting heads with uh, with someone uh, over a technical issue. And then finding out later that, oh, my goodness, there is a solution that somebody's already come up with, and here it is, and it's not that difficult to implement. In, in, any ideas on how we get through that maze to see to, to look over the fence and see something that we didn't know was there? Well, let's go back to the I, – I don't have the complete answer for you, but let's go back and look at where we talked about on element of trust. Okay, mm -hmm. if I trust you, I won't conflict. I won't, I won't have that conflict with you. Know, well, let's try for it. There's also something I use in, in my business career – when I thought I had the right answer, I would uh, I would say, don't tell me why it won't work. Tell me what we have to do to make it work. I put them in a totally different frame of mind, but also invite them, convince me. So in fact, I will have to find out what I can do to help you make it work. So that opens it up. So again, let's, let's deal with conflict. Let's deal with problems. Let's deal with through collaboration. And collaboration, if you look in the book, you see that the two arrows are coming together. And they're going up, so you got a third brand new alternative you hadn't thought of before. Uh, of course, you know there are all sorts, of, all types of problem-solving tools out there, uh, with uh, 
the process of, of, of brainstorming uh, the uh, cause and effect diagram, the, the, the Pareto principle. Uh, there's a lot of tools out there you can use and go through that process. But you also need to ask, you know, is there a technology or is there a voice out here that's not being heard that we need to, so we, we think in a different way uh, and open up the possibilities and maybe there is another alternative. And then let's let's try to, one of the things I've always tried to do is appoint somebody to be the devil's advocate in a decision making and, and challenge what the decision we're gonna, gonna make uh, and tell us why it won't work. So in fact, through our thinking process, we'll prove that it was, or we need new technology to make it work. So we gotta bring people on board to make that happen. That's a great idea, bringing a, a devil's advocate. Um, uh, yeah, Just don't let it be the same idea. person all the time. Really? Okay. Yeah, you don't you don't want the same person all the time. You want to change that role around. But uh, and so ask somebody if they would be the devil's advocate. Challenge us in our thinking here. Um, I want to uh, actually see if, switching. If, I'm going to jump in if you don't yeah, Chris, mind switching the devil's advocate role. I think uh, that actually raises a good point that av that avoids that one person being the negative guy all the time or yes. always trying to see, you know, why is, why do you say it's half full? It's half empty all the time. That's an excellent point. I, 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 I think it's worth repeating just to make, uh, and make it valid as to why it's a good point. From a leadership standpoint, also prior to going into that meeting or having that conversation, you want to talk to the person on the side say, hey, today I'd like for you to be the devil's advocate. You have the technical knowledge, you have the technical expertise. I want you to challenge us why this won't work. And they may say, well, I, I believe it does, but tell us why, why you think it, the shortcomings of it might be. So let them be the devil's advocate at that time and then change the next role the next time. But let them know ahead of time. Don't, don't call it on just in the middle of the meeting. No, absolutely. Uh, it's kind of part of the politicking. I, you know, we hate to use that word anymore, but um, by all means, I mean, setting the the, the scene before you go in um, makes perfectly logical sense. So as you said, you don't blindside somebody or put them on the spot when you didn't expect it, right. or maybe even isn't willing. Um, maybe he's 100% on board and hasn't even thought of any uh, devil's advocate issues to, to possibly present. So again, excellent point. Let me share with you uh, something we haven't really talked about yet that I think is a key element we don't really teach in the schools. And I think it is a leadership role we need to look at and it's attitude. The leadership has to have, the leader has to have the right attitude going into that meeting, has to have the right attitude when dealing with people. And uh, it's gonna be my attitude toward my people that's gonna determine their attitude toward me. You could take that and develop that into dealing with customers and clients, your boss, your spouse, your kids, your community. So one of the things we do in this course, we spend some time talking about, actually about three hours, talking about how important an attitude is. And we give you six ways to adjust the attitude. And we haven't touched on that yet as far as uh, trying to improve a look at the idea of attitudes. and. I don't know of too many people that do, but I think it's key that we, we have the right attitude for leadership. Do you have any um, uh, quick fixes for attitude? Let's say I'm getting ready to go into a meeting uh, or just to, just have a conversation with my wife and I realize, you know, my attitude really kind of sucks right now. Uh, what, what, can we do, what can we do to put a smile on or at least uh, fix that problem? You're, you're gonna say this is not, this is not really uh, possible, but one of, one of the attitude adjustment techniques we call is, is employing the flip side technique and the, the story is try to find a try to find some sense of humor in uh, in problems or issues that you have and the best example i can share with this goes back when president reagan got shot uh, if you remember when he got shot they're rushing him to the hospital and as he's walking to the door here the president of the united states has been shot but he uses this attitude adjustment with a flip side technique where he says, I forgot to duck. And then, <laughs> while, and then while he's on the operating table with the surgeons all the way around him, again, the president of the United States has been shot, very serious, very, uh, certainly not a funny affair, but find a sense of humor. His response was, I trust all of you are in fact Republicans talking to the <laughs> surgeons around the table. So here you see an, you see an example 
where a leader has, in fact, taken a very serious situation, found a sense of humor, and things really aren't really as bad as we might think they are, but at least you try to find a, find the, uh, find a sense of humor in what's going on. And there's several examples we can show like that. Yeah. Uh, another one is, uh, and, and there's actually there's about nine altogether. We break them down into six different sections. Uh, another one's called play your winners. Oftentimes we, we try to find people doing things wrong. But as a leader, you want to find people doing things right. Play your winners. Play the play the things that make it. It's both. It's in fact, it's all the same process. If somebody done something wrong, they probably didn't want to do it wrong, but the process allowed them to do it wrong. So why don't you compliment them for coming into work today? Compliment them on putting forth the extra hours. Compliment them on on the performance, learning a new skill, accepting some new responsibility. So reward your people by playing the winners instead of plan and focus on the negative and and change the process to create more winners so that that's that's a couple i'll share with you there come to the class yeah. i'll teach you the rest of them <laughs> well give giving compliments sure doesn't doesn't cost anything and it and it, uh, no, it results in, in rewards let me tell you it's chris i mean uh kurt one of the things i did um and and, and by the way i didn't get it right all the time but the last company i had prior to going to purdue university i had 420 people in a company and I had everybody's anniversary date on my calendar. So when they were in there one year, 42 years, 17 years, it didn't matter. I made it a point to try to go out and congratulate them on their anniversary date. I buy them a cup of coffee and let's just talk for a little bit. And so just doing that was rewarding them that the plant manager, the director of operations will only come out and spend some time with me and talk to me and getting to know me. And by the way, when I'm doing that, what else is happening? I'm building trust. And that's the foundation mm-hmm. for leadership. So doing little things like that makes a huge difference. Um, stress. Uh, we've A lot of us have been working from home. Um, we're finding additional stresses that we're just not used to. Uh, the company I work for asked me to produce a, a video on uh, on how to reduce stress and, and keep it out of your work life. Um, um, I found out a number of things myself, a few things I'm glad I do anyway, and a few things I've, oh, that's a good idea. I need to do that. How does stress and uh, personal stress and leadership, how are those um, intertwined? First, we need to recognize that stress is not always bad. Uh, Mm -hmm. Stress, in fact, allows us to perform at a higher level. The thing is, as a leader, we need to watch for the, the indicators that are there that when, in fact, stress is becoming harmful. Uh, people may be breaking out in highs. They, uh, let me back up a little bit. Positive stress will, in fact, help us be more energized, help us be better focused, more motivated. Uh, it also will give us some other options we can look at, uh, maybe discover new opportunities. So, in fact, stress is not always bad. Uh, negative stress, so you can, it's people with a short temper, they become very tense, very anxious, they become depressed. Uh, frustrated and it's more relevant and you can see that certainly in team meetings as you work with people so being attuned to the person's behavior gives you a chance to tune into them call them off to the side and say hey man it appears that you're you're having some stressful situations right now what can I do to help unload that or help you work through that so just just the awareness of people's behavior dealing with stress is really key and really as a leader what you do is you you you've been through it yourself from your stress, you were able to do certain things and you stayed at that plateau for a while and you grew and you matured. Then what happens? Stress starting to build again in a new job, new position, new responsibility. So you grow in, in capability as a result of more stress, but then you'll stay at a, at a higher level and it becomes normal then you mature at that and then it continues to grow from that point on. So it's actually a process we have to go through in order to uh, continue to grow as a leader. And leaders are certainly going to have stress in every situation. So our, our contemporary uh, difficulty, social distancing. We, uh, I haven't, I haven't been back to up to my employer's office in months now. Haven't seen <laughs> uh, customers face to face in in months. Yeah. Haven't seen my colleagues face to face in person in, in months. Um, how does leadership uh, work? Uh, how can I try to exhibit or learn some leadership in these conditions? That's a tough question, and, and I'm, I'm saying that because I just heard on the news today that domestic violence 
has uh, increased significantly through the people staying at home, working from home, dealing with the kids and everything else. Uh, one of the things that we teach you in this course is leader know thyself. And you have to be able to know when you've reached a point that you need to take some time away, some ways to in fact uh, de-stress. Uh, I have found ways for myself and I will teach this in my class, uh, but I will, uh, I, I have a technique I can use to in fact uh, lower my blood pressure uh, five to 15, five to 15 points just in a matter of a minute or uh, setting new goals or new activities or learning new skills that you have to do. That's a tough question though, but the leader has to know themselves I know how they're coming across to other people. I know that's not acceptable and learn to change that behavior for the sake of the organization, the sake of the marriage, the sake of the kids, whatever it is, you have to deal with that. And that's a, that's a tough soft skill you have to learn about yourself. Well, wow, I'm, uh, I'm out of questions and uh, up, up to here with information. I think I took a lot of notes here. See notes. And uh, I would love to go come and see the course myself. Chris here, do you have some uh, follow-up questions, things I'm, I may have missed or you're curious about? Well, actually, uh, as we were planning for today's show, uh, Rodney provided uh, an overview um, cheat sheet, if you will, I think, of the uh, SBE Leadership Development course. I was wondering if he would like to maybe touch on that and, and go over some of the finer points of, of what the Leadership Development course offers. Before we, before we get to that, if I may, uh, let me touch on something that, that uh, Kurt challenged me to do, I think, uh, before uh, from our previous conversation. You said, once trust is broken, how do you repair it? And I think that's a key thing that leaders need to be able to understand. And so when that, that trust change has, uh, has been broken, the question is what can you do? So let me share with you just a couple points. As a leader, you need to get out in front of your people, let them know that they can see you, be visibly uh, available to them. Uh, be credible and, and show empathy with them. And as a leader, you have to avoid to spin. They know when you're not telling the truth. They know when you're not uh, being upright and forthright with them. They know when you're putting spin at it. So uh, people can see through the efforts and when you're trying to shade the facts. So just be absolutely honest with them. Tell them the bad news as well as the good news. And oftentimes the bad news isn't as bad as we often think, think it's going to be. Um, and I have a comment here, reach beyond the media. Don't, don't believe everything you're going to see on the web or anything you're going to see on Google or Facebook or anything else. But in fact, uh, communicate with the people and answer their questions, may even have meetings with them to try to build that trust back up and talk to the employees about their concerns, what, uh, and, and be true to your word. So again, I've got about five or six, seven other things I can share with you, but come to the class and I'll be glad to share those with you. But maybe that would help a little bit about building trust. With respect to the course, uh, there's a lot more areas that in fact we go through uh, that I really enjoy. And the, the book that you have there, Kurt, is actually 23 chapters long. And so mm -hmm. we talk about uh, the last six chapters and that is dealing with the organization itself. We don't get into a lot of that. Uh, and in fact, uh, we used to do a, uh, a session on time management. And just a little note there, I don't believe you can manage time. You have to believe, you have to be able to manage the events that take your time. And the events are based upon your values. So one of the parts of the first six chapters, understand what your values are, what is important to you in your life that in fact can help you do that. One of the things we do in this course is what we call a P2C, a personal and professional commitment. So out of this training, your company's putting a lot of money in training you. I'm going to spend a lot of time. I really enjoy this, but in fact, we want you to change your approach to leadership by in fact, making a professional, commitment to your boss and to your, your organization, and also a personal commitment to your family, to your loved ones, to your kids, whatever it is. So with that, 
there's a building process over those three days that we'll ask everybody to go to. So in fact, how can they in fact better communicate? How can they show a better attitude? How can they learn more about themselves? How can they learn to deal with the dynamics of leadership that, per, that people go through? About a good example of this about the, it's called the Pareto Principle. 80% of your problems come from 20% of the people. So how do you deal with that 20% and not let the other 80% uh, get lost in, in the mix? And so that's called the art of caring leadership. So how do you care for your people? So we'll talk about that. We'll spend some time, a lot more time looking at team buildings. This is not just simply sitting down and listening to me uh, share my, my insights with you, but will I get you up out of your seat? You'll have to go through some exercises with other people. you interact with other people. Uh, and in fact, uh, it's very dynamic. Uh, I'm not sure if we're still at the uh, this distancing uh, dilemma that we have, how that's going to work as we move on, but we hopefully won't be there when we come uh, in June of next year. Looking at motivation, I gave you an example of that already. What is it motivates? It's needs, but we all have different needs. So what are the needs that we have and how to deal with conflict and stress? So there's a lot of information. And also I will provide one-on-one -on -one time with anybody who wants to spend some time and talk about their leadership potential, any issues that they have, I'll be glad to give them advice on uh, how to maybe perhaps better handle the situations they're in. No, I have yet to attend your class, um, and one of these days, I know I will. I plan to do it, um, but I, I, I've seen the photos you've taken, and and I've had other people who have attended it who've uh, mentioned it to me. It's not three days of sitting in a classroom lecture at all. It's not very all. interactive, and you several times throughout the periods uh, break up into smaller groups for smaller activities and yep. uh, more individual. Could you touch on maybe some of those? Well, we certainly do that uh, quite a few times throughout the class. Uh, we we may have a little bit of a session dealing with different generations, how do the millennials deal with the baby boomers and uh, so on. So we break them to different sessions based on generations there. We'll also break into teams uh, based on uh, the dynamics within teams. We'll have some competition on trying to solve problems together as a team and they have to work within that. We'll also have a team activity with respect to the attitudes. And then when we break you into your personality profiling, which is what we call the CAP studies, we have controllers, analyzed promoters, supporters. We put all the controllers and the analyzed promoters in their respective groups. And then they have to, in fact, uh, listen to what everybody else tells them about their behavior and really, uh, what they need to change. And then they have to write down a list of things that they're going to commit to trying to change about their leadership style based on that behavior style. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of interaction going on within teams. This looks really good. Uh, and you can find this uh, on the web um, at uh, sb.org slash LDC for leadership development course. If people want to know more about me and my background, they can also go to go on the web for Google Rodney Vandiver and you'll see a pretty long bio on things that uh, I enjoy doing, but also my experiences that I have. So I've had a pretty good career over the last 50 years and uh, I begin to tell you how old I am, but uh, it's I, I've been blessed. So I enjoy, I'm at a point in life I wanna give back. So this is part of that, giving it back. Rodney, I really think you should update your, uh, your, your um, uh, picture that we have on the website because you look better now. Than in the picture. <laughs> Bless you. <laughs> Thank uh, you, Rodney. Is there, anything, any, is, is there any last uh, last thing you'd like to mention before we go? I think we've hit just about all of it. But if there's a last tip or something you want to put out there, now's the time. I, I think, uh, and John Connor would say, we are we as a nation are overmanaged and underled, and we try to manage our way out of situations. If you don't believe that's the case, look at our government, look at our education system look at the financial systems, and we need leaders. There's a, there's a huge deficit for leaders within organizations, within uh, all types of, uh, I guess, organizations that are out there. And so my goal is to help fill that void a little bit out there with the leadership information I have, 
One of that we get into when we look at leadership essentials, and you made the comment, you believe that leaders are trained, and I do too, but some people believe leaders are, are, are born. And some people believe that, in fact, it is a situation. If you go to the to the uh, a movie quite a few years ago where we had the Hungarian rugby team crash in the Andy Mountains, an 18-year-old boy emerged as a as a leader. So they said, maybe that's a situation that creates a leader. Um, Paul Hershey and Ken Blanchard uh, address that. So we spent some time getting into situational leadership. And then uh, there's a lot of different uh, theories of leadership with respect to moral-based or principle-based leadership. So we'll touch on all of those to give them uh, an idea. Visionary leadership, transformational leadership, transactional leadership, so we'll touch on that at, at, at some level to find out where people's interests really are. It's been a pleasure, by the way, to join with you guys today and have a chance to share and give back a little bit. And hopefully it stirs enough interest that people will be, come forward and, and sign up for the course. This Brian, probably will be my, this. La <laughs> this probably be my <laughs> last ahead. time to do this. Cause I'm oh gonna, my goodness, I'm okay. Gonna, so there's, well, we'll there's try to have a, group. a good, we'll good crowd. Have a a big, yeah, big crowd uh, come the spring, and uh, we'll keep our, uh, through uh, Chris's announcements uh, and members' up updates, we'll keep everybody updated. Rodney Vandeveer, thank you so much for being with us. You've got quite uh, quite the resume, and uh, thank you for sharing your lifelong knowledge with us in ways that are effective and very helpful to us as individuals. Thank you. It's been fun. Chris here, thank you for uh, helping to put this program together today. I really appreciate uh, your leadership in doing so. Absolutely. Absolutely. Glad to do it. And as always, uh, glad to have you hosting this and, and taking the lead as far as uh, leading the conversation. Uh, once again, Rodney, I'll thank you personally as well. I'm uh, I'm always happy to hear you speak. I learn a lot from you. You're, uh, you're, you're a fount of knowledge, as they say. Uh, and I do honestly hope I do get to take your class sooner than later. Um, it's just like we all do. It's one of those things. We want to do it. And I just put it off for whatever reason. Well, that's uh, going to end soon. I can tell you that. So, you gentlemen, stay well, Chris, safe. I'll, Chris, I'll, I'll see you, uh, you wherever well. it is in Atlanta in uh, in, in in the spring. Hey, we got to go. Uh, Rodney, thank you. Chris Shearer, thank you. And I guess Chris, you're probably going to talk us out of this thing. As that's what you do. Go ahead. Yep, we got the uh, wrap up. So once again, we want to thank everybody for watching today's SPE Web Extra. This episode will be available on demand on the SPE YouTube channel. And once again, I'll remind you that by watching this webcast, you earned one half of an SPE recertification point when you recertify. We uh, want you to keep the announcements of our next SPE Web Extra, the chapter of the web, when we come back with you next month. I'm uh, Chris Scherer on behalf of Kirk Harnack. We thank you for watching and we'll see you next month.